So I think I'll, I'll just spend like five minutes to just briefly review um, uh, the, the back propagation last time. I think I, I was running behind last time, so, so I didn't have time to explain this figure, which I think probably would be useful as a high level summary of what's happening. Uh, I'm going to omit all the details. So, so I guess I, I'm drawing this in this way, like a, this is the forward path. This is how you define your network and the loss function, right? So you start with some example x, and then you have some, I, I guess this is a matrix vector multiplication, or matrix matrix multiplication if you have multiple examples. But this is a matrix vector multiplication module, and you take this, you take x in the product, or uh, multiply with w uh, and b, and then you get some activation, the pre-activation, and you get some post-activation. You take some matrix vector multiplication, and you get, uh, um, I guess I'm, I'm using I'm, I'm matrix multiplication, but actually it's matrix vector multiplication. So, uh, and you get uh, activation, and then you do this, right? This is the how you define the loss, how do you define the model. Uh, I guess the output of the model, I think last time we used tau, um, which is the output of the model, and then you have something that, defined, that defines the, the loss. Right, this is the, the so-called forward path. And, and, and uh, the, in some sense, the, 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 you can summarize the, the back propagation uh, in a way uh, like follows. So basically, uh, if I draw it, right, so this is, uh, of course, you know, what you really do is you implement this in computer. Um, but if you draw it, in some sense, you are doing it in a backward way. So what you do is you say you first compute, if you look at the, the flow, the data flow, or the, the kind of the comp the process of the back, back, props, um, back prop process. So you compute uh, the loss with respect to uh, the output first. And this is often very easy. This is like just that you take the, uh, because the loss is something like y minus tau square times a half. And this one is just a very simple formula. And then you compute, uh, you, can, you compute the derivative of the loss with respect to a two. Here I only have three layers. So and then you take the you compute the derivative of a loss with respect to z two, and then you compute the derivative of a loss with respect to uh, a one, and then something like this. This is the the, the order of the computation uh, you want, and and th this is kind of like it's kind of like you are executing this network in, in a backward fashion in some sense. Um, but how do you do this, each of these arrow? So this is by the, the lemma that we discussed, right? So, so I think we have three lemmas or three abstractions, right? So, and each of these arrow is using one of those three lemmas. So, and, and, and now you can see what this, those kind of like lemmas are, are for. Those lemmas basically are saying that if you know dj over d tau, how do you compute dj over dA? And, and, uh, and there's another lemma which says that if you know how to compute dj over dA, how do you compute dj over dz? And, and, and all of those lemmas are about this kind of relationship. Right? If you know how to compute uh, the, the derivative with respect to the output of some module, right? suppose this is a module, tau is the output of this module. Right? So if you know how to compute dj over d, the output of the module, then you want to know how to compute the derivative with, res with respect to input of the module. So all of those three lemmas are doing these things. I'm not going into the details because you know, um, we don't have enough time to review again, but that's the basic idea. And, um, and also there's another thing which is like, a, this is only about the derivative with respect to activation. You can also compute a derivative with respect to the, the weights, right? So if you know this quantity, then uh, I think if you know this quantity, then you know how to compute the derivative with respect to the last layer weight. And if you know uh, this quantity, then you know from this quantity you know how to compute the derivative with respect to W2. And from this quantity you know how to compute the derivative with, with respect to W1. And also the same thing for, for Bs. So, um, and, 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 and then this kind of the, the, the last row, these quantities, right, so they, are, they don't depend on, for example, after you get this, you can compute this, right? Um, and after you get this quantity, you can compute these two quantities. Um, but th this, this row, the, the derivative with respect to activations, you ha can only do it sequentially. You cannot say you compute this before you do this. So, so this arrow is kind of, is kind of the, the orders of the dependencies between these quantities. 
and um, and and each of these arrow, you know, is basically done by one of the lemma that we discussed last time, right? Each of the lemma is kind of dealing with the um, with this. Any questions? This is just the extension of the last five minutes of the of the first lecture. I, I didn't have enough time to elaborate on uh, on this. Okay, so um, good. So now in this lecture and the, the lecture afterwards, we are talking about, um, um, I guess, a few concepts. One concept is called generalization, which is the main um, point of this lecture. And also, next lecture, we're going to talk about uh, the concept of regularization. Uh, and next lecture, we also talk about some of the practical uh, a viewpoint of ML, like how do you really tune your model? How do you, uh, what do you have to do in this whole process, right? So like uh, you start with the data process and then you have to tune the model and then maybe you have to go back to change your data, so on and so forth. So um, so basically in these two lectures, I think we are, um, um, we're gonna discuss this kind of, um, this concept. I think that generalization is probably the main uh, thing that we are talking about here. So, um, so generalization, as you can see, it, you know, as you can guess, it's really just uh, about you know how well you are, um, your model is performing on unsynthetic examples. So we're going to discuss you know how do you make sure your model can also generalize to unsynthetic uh, examples. So so far we only talk about training, right? So we have some examples which we have seen. They are training data set, and we fit some model on top on them. Right, so and now we care about whether this model will work for future unseen examples. So and we are going to discuss, you know, um, um, uh, a bunch of concepts. You know, the balance variance trade-off, which is which is a, a kind of a principle when you think about how test error changes as you change model complexity. And we are going to talk about some of the new phenomena people have found in deep learning, which is a little bit different from the classical understanding. Um, okay, so I guess uh, um, that's a, just a very high level overview. I guess I use a lot of buzzwords. I'm not expecting everyone to follow everything. So um, let me um, maybe be concrete. Um, okay, so I guess uh, let me start with some kind of basic um, notations and notions. So I guess uh, some basic notions. One thing is this so-called training loss, which you probably already know what it means, you know, training loss, or sometimes it's called training error, sometimes it's called training cost. I think in, in this lecture, sometimes we use the word cost. So they all mean uh, the similar type of concepts. Sometimes people use loss to refer uh, certain kind of losses, and error to refuse, refers to certain other type of losses. But, uh, but they are, f from the purpose of this lecture, they are all mean the same thing, right? This is what you care about in a training, right? For example, if you care about the square loss, then the training loss would just be this. I think we have write down, we have written down this equation a lot of times. This is the loss function you care about when you have square loss. And other loss could be cross entropy loss. It could be um, 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 like a MLE, the maximum likelihood estimator. I think that's actually one principle to derive the training loss, right? You derive the maximum likelihood estimator. Uh, for, uh, for your data set, and that you use that as your training loss. You use the negative log likelihood as the training loss. So this is basically so far what we have focused on right, in the last few weeks. So how do you get a training loss, and how do you really implement uh, this and, and optimize this? Right? So there are many ways to optimize it. For example, in one of the lectures, we use the analytical formulas. Right? So when we have the GDA, we analytically compute what is the, the minimum loss, right? the minimum uh, uh, the, the minimizer of the lo negative log likelihood. And it's, you know, of the other lectures, we are using a numerical algorithm to minimize this loss, right? So like we, for example, like in deep learning, we, we are using stochastic wind descent, um, and we have talked about Newton's method, so and so forth. But so far, everything we have talked about is this loss function, and we, we try to find the minimizer of this loss function. Or, or some, or, or, you know, not necessarily exactly this one, but like either the, but always, it's always a loss function defined on the training examples. Okay, so now um, suppose you have obtained, right? So suppose we have some parameter theta. So suppose we have obtained um, some theta. 
how do you evaluate whether your theta is good or not? So ideally, you want the model to not only perform well on the training data, because for the training data, you already know the prediction, right? Why you care about letting the model to predict something you already know, you already know. So what you really care about is you care about, you know, uh, you want to evaluate uh, on unseen examples. So that's why the test loss is defined on unseen examples. Um, and I'm going to use this notion. So suppose let's say you draw, so the process is that you draw some new example, x comma y, from some description d. And often this is called test description. And, and then you evaluate what's the ex expected loss on this uh, new test example. So you look at L theta, which is the expected loss um, of the, and the expectation is over the randomness of this new example drawn from this test distribution. So what's important is that this x and y is not seen in the training. It's a new, fresh example. Um, and of course, here I'm defining it as expectation, right? So actually, in place, I'm taking average over the entire distribution. So, so if you really want to do it empirically, what, what this really means is that you draw a bunch of examples. Maybe let's call it x1 test, test1. You draw maybe m of this. These are another examples you have used for training. These are new examples you draw um, during the test time. You draw them from d, id from d, this distribution d, and then you evaluate the, imper the error on this set. So, and you evaluate average error on average loss on, on this set, on the test set. Because you know that if you evaluate on this test set, uh, it's, it's pretty much just approximating this expectation. You are just using an empirical way to estimate the, the expected uh, value. Right, like if you want to, ex you want to, if you want to estimate any expect any, the expectation of any random variable, one way to do it is you just draw multiple copies from the same distribution and you take the ar empirical average. Right, that's why the test set uh, is a reasonable estimate for the, um, for the test error. And just to be clear, these test examples, you know, you don't, you haven't seen them in a training set. They are something you draw, um, you know, you can draw them in advance, but you, don't, you cannot let them to be seen in the training, uh, the training process. And there is a notion called generalization gap So I guess this notion, often people call, this is basically talking about the difference between the test loss and the training loss. And oftentimes, you know, it's not always true, but oftentimes the training loss is less than the test loss. When you test, you found that your model is not as good as you thought before on the training set. You know, you know it's probably, sometimes it's probably a little bit worse, sometimes it's a lot worse, uh, sometimes they are very similar, but generally you shouldn't expect that your test performance is just dramatically better than the training performance. Uh, and of course, in extreme cases, you, you can design data set such that this happens, but, but I think in, in, in realistic, practical situations, I don't think you should expect that at all. Um, so, so, so it's often the case that this gap is either very close to zero, or maybe a slightly negative, slightly positive, or it's, it's, it's much bigger than zero. So you want this gap to be as small as possible. So, so basically, you, you just, you, you, in some sense, you care about two quantities. You care about the, the training loss, and you care about the gap. You want both of these two to, to be small. If both of these two be small, or if both of them are small, then the sum of them will be small, and that's your test, right? Your test loss is small. Um, that's, that's the hope. You hope that these, both of these two are, are small. OK. Um, so this one is something you can control in some sense, right? This is what you try to optimize for, right? But this one is harder to control because you don't, so 
right? Because you cannot say I'm going to find a theta such that L theta is small. Because if you do that empirically, you, you try to optimize theta such that the test loss is small, then you have to see the test data set, right? So, 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 so that's why you cannot really literally easily control this because you, you, you are not allowed to see the test data set. So you, you, like, uh, you cannot choose your theta based on the loss. You can only choose theta first and then you evaluate the loss, but not vice versa. So that's why the, the, the generalization gap is something that is very hard to control. Uh, at least you cannot directly control it. You know? And, and, and the, the point of this lecture is to discuss you know, in what cases you can somewhat know this is not too big. Right? Like when this can, can, you can hope that this is not too big. Um, um, OK. So and, and let me also, uh, before getting into more details, let me also define of two notation, two kind of like commonly used uh, terminology. So um, of course, we are dealing with the case when L theta, so we are mostly concerned about the case when L theta is too big, right? So if L theta is small, that's great, right? You don't have to worry about anything. So when L theta is big, the question is you know, what, what we do to change it, right? Like if you observe that your test loss is very big, then what you can do to make it smaller? That's the kind of the question you want to study. So, and typically when L theta is big, you can, you, there are two uh, failure mode in some sense. These are not supposed to be, um, these are not supposed to be, um, you know, comprehensive, but I think uh, typically you are in either one of these two failure mode. So one of the failure mode is called um, a failure patterns. So one of the failure mode is called overfitting. And so overfitting, you know, I'm going to discuss a lot about overfitting. Um, but, you know, the first other bit is that the typical situation of overfitting is that the, the training loss, J, is small. But the, the, the test loss is big. So you have this big generalization gap. So you have a discrepancy between training and test. So that's, at least that's, you know, that's not a definition for overfitting, but that's a very, um, uh, a, 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 a very typical um, characteristic of overfitting. So, um, for example, I guess I, I'll probably draw this, you know, very often. Uh, I'll draw this kind of figure very often uh, in in this lecture. So, suppose you have uh, um, some x and some y. You have some data set. I guess the running example I'm going to do is that I'm going to have some data set that lives very close to this uh, quadratic fu quadratic function. So the the, the data are approximately quadratic. So x and y, so you want, to, it's a one dimensional problem. So given x, you want to predict y. And you observe some, um, so you have a data set, for example, you have four points. So each point is like this, maybe this, and something like this, maybe something like this. Right, so you, have, you see these four blue points, and you want to fit a line to it, or fit a, some curve to it. And the question is, what curve you're going to fit? So suppose you fit something crazy like this. Let me try to see what color I'm using for this. Uh, sorry, one moment. Let me um, think about how do I use the color in a consistent way. Yeah. So I guess if you fit, I'm going to use black for, for the model you fit. So suppose your model that you fit is something like this. I'm drawing something crazy. So this model is, I, I intentionally make this model to pass these points. Exactly. So this model fits the data, the, the four training data perfectly. Right, so the J theta is really small. It's kind of close to zero, but you can imagine this model shouldn't generalize to unseen examples, right? So suppose you, suppose you, um, um, you generate some ANSI examples, you know, you, and you kind of believe that ANSI examples also are kind of like similar, um, like have a quadratic relationship. You generate something like this, maybe somewhere here, maybe somewhere here. Then you can see that the, the fitting to the, the right point becomes very worse. So um, uh, much worse, becomes much worse. So the, so the test loss is very big. So, so this is a, a, a typical situation of overfitting. In some sense, you are saying that you, you fit to the data very well, but you are, you are, uh, you are overfitting in the sense that you, you, um, 
you only focus on the training data, but you, you, you kind of like um, forget about the, the, the test performance. You know, I will discuss why this will happen. Um, I guess you can probably guess. Um, but this is, um, for so far, I'm just defining the roughly what overfitting means. So it means that you are not, um, you, you fit the training data, but you don't, you don't generalize. And another um, uh, notion is called underfitting. So, and underfitting basically just means that you fit something like this. Maybe let's say you fit this. Suppose this is uh, another model you fit. So underfitting just means that both the, the j, the j theta is also big. So, so even your model does, doesn't even do well on a training set, and that, that is basically means underfitting. Um, so you, you, as, as the word suggests, that you are not fitting the, the data. Um, and, and whether you are in the overfitting regime or the underfitting regime or in the, in the nicer regime um, depends a lot on different things. And one kind of decision we are trying to discuss today is that, you know, what is the right model complexity? So like whether you're gonna use linear model, maybe use all quadratic, or maybe fifth degree polynomial, or a new right work, so on and so forth. So we're gonna discuss, you know, uh, what will happen if you change your model complexity and whether, you know, in what cases you may underfit, in what cases you may overfit, and what is the best sweet spot. Any questions so far? And kind of like as a spoiler, in some sense, like uh, we're going to discuss two, um, we're going to uh, decompose the test error L theta. The test error is the, the test loss, and the L theta. We're going to decompose this into two terms. Actually, I'm not going to show it mathematically uh, because I don't think I have enough time to do that. But intuitively, you're going to de decompose the test error into two terms, which is called, one is called bias, and technically it's bias squared because the bias is defined as the square root of this term. Um, so plus variance. So you're going to have this, you're going to define these two terms uh, and, and say that these two terms, if you take the sum of them, it will be the test error. And these two terms has this property that the bias uh, it's gonna be uh, an increasing function. So we're gonna see something like this. The bias is gonna be a decreasing function as the model complexity. I haven't told you what the bias is, what the variance is. I'm just uh, kind of giving you a kind of like a, a, a spoiler on what kind of things we're gonna discuss. So the bias is something like this and and the variance is something like this. So these are, basically you are kind of like trying to figure out the underlying kind of like mechanisms. Um, so, so, so the mechanism is that if you change the model complexity to make it more complex, then you, your, bias, your variance will be bigger and the bias will be smaller. And your, your sum of these two functions, which is a test error, will be something like this. And, and then the, the best one will be something in the middle. So, so this is the kind of the, uh, um, a uh, quick overview of what we're going to discuss. So, all right. Okay, so now I'm going to um, define bias and variance um, in a little bit more formal uh, ways. Still not very formal, like, uh, like, there, there is, um, like uh, I'm going to start with, uh, like it's a, it's, a it's a gradual process. I'm going to have a little bit more formal definition of the bias. Okay, and, and I show some uh, examples. So, any questions so far? Why is the bias discriminating? Why is the bias crazy? Oh, screw it. I mean. Oh, this is just, uh, maybe I should draw. This is just because it's kind of a unit thing. You, you define a bias <laughs> to be the, um, it's just a, um, how do I say this? Like, it's, it's a definition, like a, like a, actually some people call the, the, the bias square as bias. Actually, it's in some literature, sometimes people take a square root. It's, it's just a, how do you choose the right unit? Um, yeah, and, and I, I, you know, when I say bias, I, I don't really distinguish whether it's squared or not. It's, 
So, um, okay, so I guess um, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to have a running example, which is basically like this. And I'm going to uh, kind of like try um, what, what happens with linear fifty degree polynomial. These are, uh, and, uh, and, and kind of use this kind of as a thought experiment to demonstrate these quantities. So let's start with linear. So this is, um, in, in, in sometimes this is a, a thought experiment, but, but actually we have some real data experiments in the lecture notes. Here I'm just drawing this. Um, um, so like, uh, um, but I think uh, it's, um, it's basically pretty much the same. So, so suppose you, okay, maybe I will set up just really quick. So uh, my running example is basically like what I um, drew above. Um, so, so I'm gonna have some training examples. And these training examples are something like yi is equals to a quadratic function. Quadratic, which is just this quadratic um, in my train of xi, and plus a little bit noise. This is a small noise. So that's why these blue points are not exactly lies on the quadratic, it just there's a little bit of fluctuation. So, um, and sometimes I think, um, I guess this quadratic, sometimes I call this h star xi. Just for the sake of terminology, I think sometimes I call this the ground truth. This is the, in some sense, the, the, the true function you are trying to find out. Um, but of course, you don't know it, you want, to, you want to try to recover it. And I'm gonna do a thought experiment first. You know, I'm gonna do a few experiments. I'm gonna start with linear model, and then I'm gonna try fifth degree polynomial, and then I'm gonna try quadratic. So, um, so linear model. Suppose you have a linear model. I guess you can probably see, you know, what will, guess what will happen. So I will draw this again. So you have this. Four data points, something like this. Then what happens with linear model is that, you know, you have these four points. What's the best linear fit? Probably would be something like maybe this for this particular data set. Right, so, and, and you can see that uh, what's the, wh what are happening here? So maybe, let me see, how do I? Mm, maybe let me erase this for the moment. Just, uh, I'm, I'm gonna redraw this again. So for linear models, I guess you can see a bunch of properties, right? So you can see that there's a large training error. Training loss or training error, let's call it loss. Loss just for consistency. There's a large training loss because, um, I guess, what's your prediction on a training data set? This is your prediction for this, for this x, right? So, so this is x1, and the prediction is here, and the prediction for x2 is here, the prediction for x3 is here, the prediction for x4 is here. And you look at the distance between the prediction and the true label, you see that the distance is pretty big. Right, so, um, so the, training, the training error is pretty big. And so, and, and so, so this is underfitting, okay, by our definition of underfitting, because the training is already big. And now let's uh, think about, so, what, what you should blame, right? Why the training is big? What, what's, the, what's the culprit? The, the culprit, you know, I would argue is that it's just because no any linear model can fit your data. It's not just, right, no any linear, no any linear model can, can work. And it's not because you don't even have enough data, it's just because, you know, like uh, even you have more data, a linear model wouldn't work as well. Right, so this is just because the linear model is not expressive enough. So, and, and, that's the, and this is called bias. So this is, so this is called bias. So when this kind of settings, um, things happens, you, you, 
like uh, you have the bias. So the bias is um, basically like it's, say, it's saying that okay, the the reason why I you know I don't know exactly why people call it bias in the, in the very first time, but I think you can kind of the, the kind of the relationship. The, the thing is that you are you are imposing additional structure, right? So you are imposing a linear structure, but the true data is not linear. So it doesn't matter you how many data you see, if you as long as you impose this, you you just insist that. I just believe that this thing is, is linear, you're gonna fail because this is the wrong <laughs> belief about the relationship between y and x. So that's why this is called bias. And this is not, you cannot mitigate, cannot be mitigated by more data, as I said. And, and I actually, it can also not be mitigated by less noise, even your data is more, and by less noise data, right? Because even you have more data and with less noise, you can imagine what happens, right? So suppose you see a, a, a little more data. Suppose you see some more data as training data, right? And now, and maybe let's say you just, uh, you know, suppose in the extreme case, you just see everything on, on this, exactly on this, on this quadratic line without any noise. Still, if you think about what's the best fit, for example, let's say you, just, you, you see all of these blue and uh, green points, and what's the best fit? The best fit probably would change a little bit. That's true, right? It probably wouldn't be exactly this, maybe it would be, I guess it would be something like this, maybe. Maybe something like this, I don't know. Like, uh, you have to trade off, right? Because, you know, whatever you fit, right? If you fit this, then you, you don't fit some of these examples. If you do, you know, there's no any option, right? Like, whatever, just because linear model cannot represent quadratic function, that's it. So, so that's the, the typical uh, situation where you have a, a large bias. And, and mathematically, so, the way you define bias, so here I'm just only talking about some characteristics of having a large bias. So mathematically, one way to define a bias, you know, is that you can say this is the, um, so bias is, I guess actually there's some approximation here depending on what exactly your model is, but roughly speaking, it's the, 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 the best uh, error or loss uh, you get you can get with even infinite data. So you, you, as, I guess, you know, if you ha suppose you have infinite data, you have a data set with infinite data following the same kind of property, right? So like uh, all generated from this quadratic plus noise, then what's the best you can do? And that's called bias. And, and you can kind of see that, you know, it's probably important for bias to be small because if his bias is large, even with infinite data, you cannot do anything, right? So, um, and that's the, that's the problem with linear models. Any questions? Can bias be called as something like the, the distance from the long term model or something like that? Um, I, think, I think that's pretty much, you know, uh, so for this case, they're pretty much they are the same. So basically, so, so, so in, this, in this case, it's exactly true that the bias is the best linear model, uh, so the closest, like the closest linear, mo the model that is closest, the, the, the linear model that is closest to the ground truth. And, and that error, that, that closeness is, is the bias. Right, because when you generate infinite data, basically you just generate the ground truth, the whole line, right, if you have no noise. Okay, um, by best error you mean like, I don't know, within the same model, you're not changing the model, right? You are not changing the model class. You are only using linear, but you cannot. Okay, so bias would be the best error with the linear model with data. Right, right, exactly. So in, in some sense, technically, you should say bias is is is, is property of the the, the 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 family of models, right? So so the linear model the linear model family has large bias, right? I I think you know. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's that, you know, we are always talking about model family, right? So we are talking about either linear model family, the family of linear models, or the family of fifth degree polynomial, or the, the family of quadratics. Okay, cool, so this is the bias. And now let me talk about the variance. Um, and here there is, you know, I, I'll, I'll come back to the variance for this model, but uh, here 
the variance is in, in some sense you can say uh, is not, not very important. Uh, only the bias is the culprit. And now I'm going to show a cases where the variance is the culprit to blame for. So, um, so I guess I'm going to redraw uh, this. So you have. Some On these four points. Okay, so now I'm going to fit a fifth degree polynomial. So the model is something like h theta x is you know some theta five x to the five plus up to theta zero. Right. Recall that we can do this with with linear regression because you just uh, this is still linear in the theta, right? We have a homework question on this. We also talk about how to do this, you know, with kernel method if if you care about efficiency, so and so forth, right? So so we are able to do fit this, and and in the lecture notes actually there are some visualizations of the real real models you're gonna fit. So here I'm just gonna draw it. Um, so if you fit a 50 degree polynomial, so probably you're gonna get a 50 degree polynomial can be can can go up and down so many times, several times. I think technically a 50 degree polynomial you can have, I think four, four global, four local, four local, or, uh, four local maximum or minimum, four or five, something like that. So the more, the, the higher the degree is, the more t times you can go up and down, right? So, um, right, because if you have a quadratic, the only thing you can do is this or maybe this, and for, for cubic you can do this, and for for fourth degree polynomial you can probably do something like this, right? So. Uh, um, so the exact details here don't matter. So uh, just the, the the point is that if you have high degree polynomials, you can you can be more flexible, right? And then if you fit the data, um, if you fit the the polynomial to the data, then possibly you can you, you are going to get something kind of pretty flexible, something like this. And actually, if you really look up uh, some. Like this is not required for this course, but like if you look up the book for the calculus of like polynomials, you know that if you have four points, there's always a 50 degree polynomial that passes through all of them. So, in some sense, if you don't have enough points and your degree is high enough, then you just uh, you can always you can always uh, make the training error zero, literally zero. So in this case, the training error is literally zero. So. So and 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 then why? Wait, so I, I guess this is expected. And the, the the thing is that so this is overfitting. So but why? What's the problem here? Why is overfitting? So why um, the test is not good? So in some sense, the kind of the the intuition is that this kind of model fits. So it fits to the spurious patterns. To the spurious patterns. Um, you know, in the in the small and noise data, small. And noise data. So, so this is because you don't have enough data, and, and your model tries to explain all of these no, small perturbations, small noise, uh, and because it over explains the small noise, it, it lost it, it. It kind of like uh, didn't pay enough attention to the to the more important stuff. And and the reason why you can overfit to the small noise or the, the finite data is because. Um, because you, you are you are so flexible, right? So whatever patterns you, you, you see in these four points, as long as you just have four points, whatever crazy patterns you see, you can always find the degree five polynomial to explain it, right? So so whatever patterns you see in four data points, you know, like you can explain it. So that doesn't sound right, right? So like, uh, how come your model can explain like everything and anything like uh, random? So 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 basically you are you are looking at the you, you are kind of like overfitting to the spurious um, patterns. Um, but instead of the the, the big patterns, right? the big pattern is this, right? The spurious patterns are the, the fluctuations, in some sense, right? So, um, and so, or in other words, I think you are you are kind of explaining the noise instead of the the ground truth. So, um, and 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 okay, how do you make this intuition a little more formal? So, okay, I'm not going to go very very formal, but. To, like a, some more kind of like a, things I can say about this intuition is that this is saying that you are sensitive, your model is sensitive or maybe kind of like specific 
to, to the noise. How do I formulate this? Like a, one way to kind of formulate this a little bit more mathematically is that you can consider you redraw uh, the samples. And you ask, when, after you redraw the samples, are you going to see the same model again? Right, so you redraw some new samples with different spurious patterns, right? Because they are spurious because they are noise, right? So, so if, if, your, if your model is specific to the spurious patterns, that means that if you redraw, you are going to, spec you are going to learn the new spurious patterns, and you are going to have a different model. And if you are not specific or sensitive to spurious patterns, even you have a new data set, you probably shouldn't change much, right? You should still be somewhat the same. You should still output the same model. And it turns out that if you have the five degree polynomial, you redraw the data set, then you will find a new model. So what happens is that suppose you um, uh, redraw the data set. Actually, in, in the lecture notes, there are some real experiments again, but uh, here I'm just going to uh, draw, draw them. So suppose, for example, now you still have the same ground truth, but you observe some, maybe let's say here I'm going to have some data point like this, maybe data point like this. Maybe data point like this, and uh, I'm going to try to make the pattern a little bit different. Then maybe you, you're going to get um, something different. Maybe, I don't know. Like you, you try to find out what's the degree of fifth polynomial, maybe you're going to get something like this. OK, actually, this, these two are still a little bit similar, but I can draw anything. I, empirically, you, you'll see that they will, they will be different, just because you know, any small perturbations of this would change a lot. But maybe you, you, you get this. So and and if you actually you can also do some local thing right suppose you move these points a little bit lower then you probably would change this function a lot so just because you are very sensitive to the data points. I guess we're drawing the same number of samples again, right? Not increasing the number of samples. Right. So 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 far I'm saying that you you, you don't you don't you draw, you draw the same number of samples with similar ground truth and the same ground truth and distribution, but just uh, their the randomness are different right you are using different noise, so. Um, right, so, and, and th th that's a good question. That's exactly what I'm going to talk about next. So, so, uh, um, okay, sorry, one moment before that. So, so basically, okay, just to summarize here. So, if if you read all the examples and you find that a, a large variation between, so suppose you have a, a so you, you so you have um, um, so you call this so so basically you define a variance to be. Uh, in some sense, the, the variations across um, models learned on different data sets. So, for example, you draw five data sets, right? So each data set has four examples, maybe, and you try. You do these experiments, and you get five models learned on five different data sets. So if you see a lot of differences between these models, right, so then that means you have large variance. And, and, and if you don't see a, large, a lot of differences, then you don't have a large variance. That's the somewhat formal definition of this. It, you know, we will have a little bit more formal version of this, but this is the, the idea. Right, so, so maybe, for example, if you, you get a new data set, you get something like uh, maybe here, 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 and maybe you, you're going to learn something very different, maybe something like this. Right, so, and there are all some, so here, at least you can see this one is very different from this one, because on the left-hand side here you're going up, here you're going down, so, um, so, so that suggests that you have large variance. And, and now talking about data, right, so suppose, so, so this, one of the characteristic of Variance is that variance is something that can be uh, reduced if you have more data. So, um, and, and, and in some sense, the variance is caused by lack of data, and it can be mitigated uh, if you have more data. So let me continue here. I should just keep uh, all of these markers in my hand, otherwise I have to walk back and forth. Uh, okay, so. So the, the variance, in some sense, you can say this is caused at least partially. You know, at least one cause is that um, this is caused by lack of data. And 
Um, and okay, of course, you know, it's, it's probably you cannot say this is only caused by loss of data because you know if you have um, a different model, right? If a very very so in some sense there are two reasons. One thing is, is like you have lack of data, and the other is you have too expressive, too expressive uh, models. And these two things are kind of like uh, relative to each other, right? So if you have uh, a very expressive model, but your data is really really big, then probably it's okay. On the other hand, you know, if you have not too many data, but you have very, very simple model, then it's probably still okay. So, um, and, and, and as you can see that, you know, then if these are the, the issue, the, the reason, then you, how do you mitigate the variance? Then the mitigation is just that, the mitigation is that either you, you get more data, or you have small, simpler model. So typically, you don't have more data. If you have more data, you should already use them already. Um, but uh, for, the, for, the, for, the, um, for the understanding, let's see, for example, what happens if you have more data with this, with this thing. Right, suppose you have more data, and you still fit a fifth degree polynomial. So suppose you have uh, a lot more data. This is the ground truth. And you observe a lot of more data. I say you have a million data, right? Roughly, you know, there's a little bit of fluctuation, of course. So now you want to fit a fifth degree polynomial. What happens will be that this is probably not entirely obvious, but like, okay, one obvious thing is that you cannot, you probably wouldn't do anything like crazy as this, right? Because if you do this a crazy thing, maybe this crazy thing goes through some points, but you cannot go through all the points, right? Like, uh, for example, right, you can see th here is, there's a big match between this part and these this points, right? And here you have some. Uh, mismatch, right? So, so this this one wouldn't give give, give you even a small um, training error. So right? this is not the best model fit on the training data. So what you really will fit, uh, like if you minimize the error on the training data with this so many training examples, then what you get will get is probably something like this, more like this. Maybe there's still some sm small fluctuation. It's not like necessarily matching exactly the ground truth. But you have a little bit small fluctuation, but it would be something like this. Because, because if you don't do this, then you wouldn't uh, fit the training data as good as well. And, and this is, you know, you know, this is kind of like more like a quadratic, but a, you know, but a fifth degree polynomial contain the family of degree five polynomial contains the family of quadratic function because you can just set you can just set your theta five, theta four to be zero, then you get a quadratic. So Empirically, what you're gonna do find is that probably this is, if you really look at the details, this, the best fit model is still degree five polynomial, but the theta five, theta four, the first few coefficients are very, very small. So effectively, you are just very close to a quadratic. Another source of error is because with like more complicated models, it's harder to train using bigger method points to create a descent. So because it's not like a more possible model, it's not also a source of like Right. So, so the question is like a, um, another po possibility is that a failure mode is that you just couldn't find this degree five polynomial, right? You you find because some optimization issue, right? Maybe, maybe um, even though there exists one that is very good that fits the data, but you couldn't find it. Um, that's 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 probably not true for degree fifth polynomial for this one toy example, just because this is uh, very simple. But it could be possible uh, for 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 some other cases where you just the, the model does exist, but you cannot find it. So, so this uh, is something that we don't discuss, in, uh, at least in the scope of this lecture. So in this lecture, we are, we are assuming that you can just, optimization always works, you always find the best model. So, um, so if it exists, you can find it. So, um, so that's why, like, uh, I'm, I'm, like, like there, there, in this case, you know, even you have a lot of data, right? And even you have a very complex model, say degree five polynomial, or even degree 10, maybe in this case, right? So, there's always exist one model, right, that, that works, which is like something like this. 
like, they, they like the ground truth, and 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 we will find it. You know, for for this case, definitely we will find it because it's a it's a linear regression problem. You will find it, the best model. Right. So, okay, cool. So, um, and and also another maybe just uh, to to answer the question. So, um, um, so in some sense, the, the the problem you are referring to is easier is easier to detect in some sense to some extent. It's not always true, because at least you can detect that from the training. Right, so here we are more, more talking about generalization. So, okay, cool. So, any other questions? Um, what happens when the that is not following, that is completely outside the range, and it's not following the same condition? If you have more data. Yeah, you need more data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 so here, when I say more data, I really mean that you have, you just collect, you, you, you have more data from the same distribution. Like, a, from, so, the from the same distribution. Yeah, yeah. So like, if if you collect more data from, yeah. So like, in some sense, you 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 kind of like the 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 mindset. You know, I'm not saying this is universally applicable to every situation, but the mindset we are in is that, um, for example, you have um, um, how do I say? It? Like, you have a lot of like a, um, like medical images, right? So like, they they are, for example, there is a, a million patients with the cancer diagnosis kind of thing. And, but not all of the data are, uh, are labeled, right? So like only probably, at the beginning, I only have four, four images that are labeled as cancer or not, you know, so on and so forth. And now, but, but these four images are, are sampled from this big population. And now I'm asking, you know, I found out my variance is very big. So how do I mitigate that? So I probably, one thing is that I can just sample more data from the same, like I started, I have like one million un unlabeled examples, right? I, I, I had four labeled ones, and now I say I'm, I'm gonna collect more labels. So I, I sample like another, like 100 uh, examples from the same distribution, and then I label them, and then I run the algorithm, and the variance will be smaller. So for the bias part, you actually don't know the wrong truth of the data. How do we know that we hold the wrong beliefs after? So it is a linear structure. Right. So the question is that how do you, like if you don't know the ground truth, right? So how do you know that you are uh, you are having a large bias? So so that's uh, like a, like a, you you cannot really exactly know when you don't know the ground truth. So all of these are so far are for analysis purpose, right? So when you don't know the ground truth, um, you cannot really exactly um, let me think. So. Um, yeah, when we don't know the ground truth, I, I think you cannot um, um, exactly compute the bias. Um, because you know, the, the definition of the bias actually requires you to sample a lot of <laughs> uh, like data, right? So you also don't have infinite data. So, so there's no way you can evaluate the bias exactly. So, so, so typically what you do is you say, um, you fit the data on the training set, uh, and you see you are underfitting. And that's, that's when you say, when you're underfitting means like you have, uh, um, you have a large training error, and that's when you start to believe that you have a large bias. Always that you in the graph that you that's like behind you. There's bias square. There's variance. What's the third one? The third one is the sum of them. This is the test error. Okay, and yeah. bias is which one of them? Bias is this one. Uh, I I'll discuss. I'll discuss that in a moment. Like because I, I didn't uh, when I draw this, I didn't even tell you what is what the, what are them. I'll go back to come back to this. Uh, for highly imbalanced data set, so maybe let's discuss this offline. I, I'm not sure whether this. Uh, I think it probably requires more. You know, the imbalanced data set is is pretty often. You know, like we have research on that, but maybe it's not exactly re related to the context here. Yeah. Maybe we can discuss offline. Um, any other questions? Okay, I think I still have something to say about the, the variance. Um, and then I'll come back to the, the trade-off. Um, all right, so, so basically, okay, so now 
Let's see. So let's briefly summarize. Um, So basically, if you have the bias, this is really just about the lack of model expressivity. It's something of intrinsic, nothing to do with data. Right? This is just a uh, lack of, if you have large bias, then it means you have a lack of um, like expressivity. The model is not expressive enough. Doesn't depend, doesn't depend much on the data. Um, I guess, you know, for linear models, you can just say it doesn't depend on the number of data. For non-linear models, there is some technicality, you know, which, you know, you don't have to, like, the only reason why I add much is just because, you know, there's some technicality for, for, that provides me to say this is exactly irrelevant to the number of data, but, but you should basically just believe that it doesn't, it's, 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 intuitively, it's not a notion about how many data you have. It's, it's really about how expressive your model is. So, um, and variance, uh, you know, if you have a large variance, then you, in, it could be two things, where one is lack of data, and another thing is that you have a too complex of a model. Okay, I guess I'm just repeating, summarizing, and then I guess we can see this uh, trade-off. Um, so, I guess I'll go to here, so, and also there's a way to, for you to prove that test is equal to bias plus, plus variance. Uh, I don't think I have, uh, I will see whether I have time to discuss that. Um, but, um, but you can also prove the test error is equal to the bias square plus variance. Um, so, but maybe let's just uh, draw this from scratch. So this side is the model complexity, right? So let's first think about how do you draw the bias on the, right? This is the test, this is the, uh, how do you draw the, the bias on this curve as model complexity change? So we say that, the bias is large is because your model is not, com mo is not expressive enough. So that means that if your model is more expressive, then your bias should decrease. So that's why the bias is a decreasing function as the model complexity. Right, so this is the bias. And now let's, let's think about how do you draw the variance on this thing. So the, uh, we said the variance is caused because you have too complex of a model. That means if your model is more and more complex, then you should have bigger and bigger variance. That's why the variance is like this. And, and a test error is the sum of them. So, so the test error is like a U-curve thing. So the test error, wait, where is my? Oh, here. So the test error is the sum of these two. And uh, oh, this is the variance. And, and, so the question you want to answer is that if you change the model complexity, what is the best test error, right? So, so it means that somewhere in the middle. So, um, so, so, so like, a, um, actually there, I'm gonna tell you something different from this, you know, in a moment, just a, um, but it's suppose you believe in this, then what the conclusion, the implication of this is that um, you should um, somehow kind of find a sweet spot when you, when you choose the model complexity. Right, so for example, maybe at the beginning you found that your, your training error is very low, sorry, training error is very high, which means your bias is very, very high, right? So suppose your model complexity is here, then suppose your model complexity is very small, and then, 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 then what happens is the bias is high, and the bias is high, it means you are underfitting, and it means that your training error is, is big. So basically, you, when you see the training error is big, you cannot see your biases, you cannot believe that your bias is too high, so that's why you should increase the model complexity. And at some point, you found that you are in a in a, the other regime where the variance is too high, then you should you should stop. So basically, you increase the model complexity to, to some extent until your variance um, uh, is uh, uh, your bias and variance has the right trade off. Uh, will the bias and variance curves change if we use different type of models? Like if the ground truck Yeah, so I think this, this figure, so this is the, okay, you, you, you asked a good question, right? So here, this is the model complexity of the, the model you use to learn the, 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 the your, 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 your parametrized model, 
right? So when you're asking about what, what happens if the ground truth is different, right? So um, the, when the ground, I think this is not very sensitive to what the ground truth is, right? There's always a trade-off. But, but, but where the trade-off comes from, you know, where the sweet spot is would depend on the real ground truth. So uh, for example, actually that's a very good question. For example, suppose you, uh, for, for, for this data set, right? So probably the best thing is to use quadratic. Quadratic would, uh, has small enough bias because you know quadratic is in, in principle expressive enough to express our data. So that's why quadratic has small bias. And also quadratic is probably the, among all the models with small bias, among all the models that can express your function, quadratic is the least complex, right? So that's why you use quadratic, then it's the, probably the best uh, solution. And if you really run a random algorithm, the quadratic, you would probably recover something very close. Yeah. So, um, but if your ground truth is cubic, then maybe the sweet spot is, like uh, the, the best trade-off is achieved uh, at cubic, maybe. And, you know, it's not, and they don't necessarily have to match each other because it also depends on the data, uh, how many data. For example, suppose you are, maybe let's, let's give you an example. Suppose say um, your ground truth is a degree 10 polynomial, but it somewhat look like a linear function. So, so, so suppose your ground truth is a, your ground truth is like a, um, almost linear, but with a little bit kind of like small fluctuation. And, but you don't have a lot of data. You just have like a five data points, right? So you just have five training data points. And now if you want the bias to be literally zero, then of course you should use degree 10 polynomial because that's, that's the only case you are expressive enough. But, maybe, but then your variance is too big. So the, so the, so the right trade-off here probably is closer to be a linear because if you use a linear, your bias is not zero, but still, you know, small enough, right? Uh, and and that, in that case, the variance is small. So, so, so the, the, right, the, the best trade-off depends on, for example, how many data you have as well. Right, that, that's a good question. And, and, and the, the answer to that is that no, you cannot compute a bias and virus. So all of this, um, all of what we discussed today is, is more about um, some internal understanding. So this bias and virus is not something you can, um, at least uh, in some cases you can estimate them a little bit, but t typically you don't, you probably shouldn't really actively estimate the, the, the bias and virus in, in your, in your so these are mostly just for, it's an internal understanding for, for for, for, for our research, for ourselves, but not necessarily something you empirically evaluate. Um, so, okay, so, so I guess, so one question, you know, I guess ma many of you probably are wondering, you know, if all of these quantities cannot be even evaluated, you know, how do you choose the right trade-off? What's the optimal model complexity? So what you do is actually, that's, that's gonna be, I think what we discuss mostly next week, uh, ne next lecture, so, this is this is Wednesday, right? Next week, yeah. So, um, so you, 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 the the variance and bias, uh, the variance and bias are just uh, for understanding. Empirically, what you really do is that you try to, you should try to uh, try a lot of different models and you select based on a validation set, right? But but this picture would let you know uh, to, would would help you a little bit in some sense because, for example, suppose you have tried this and this and this and this. Suppose you have tried four model complexity, right? So, and suppose you believe that this is a U-curve, the test error is a U-curve. Then should you try even bigger models? M bigger family of models, probably you shouldn't, right? Because you believe that, you kind of believe that it will be even worse. So, so you should just try even more in, in, the, in the middle, right? So that's the, what, what this understanding will help you. Okay, so um, there is some uh, f more formal definition of the, of the bias and variance, and that's in the lecture notes in section 8.1. I think I don't have time to discuss the formal uh, definition. E even if I give the definition, I probably wouldn't be able to give you the proof. The proof is actually relatively simple, so if you are interested, you can, you can read that section yourself. Um, I don't think it's required for the, for the, for the exam or anything, um, but it's a, it's a relatively s simple rate uh, if you're interested. And, and also, just uh, this kind of bias variance trade-off is not that always easy to, to achieve mathematically. So 
uh, for square laws, there is a classic, you know, well-established kind of decomposition. But if you don't have square laws, you don't have MIC, like mean squared error, if you have cross entropy laws, actually it was an open question, how do you formally de decompose this? So, um, so in, in all the intuitions still apply, right? So, but like how do you do the mathematical decomposition is actually um, pretty challenging. Um, so that's why in the, in, the, in the lecture notes, we only talk about square laws. And, and it, anywhere, you, you, if you read any textbook or any literature, probably they will talk, talk about square laws. Um, um, but the, the intuition is still kind of fine, right? So if you don't care about what exact definition of flies is. So I'm gonna spend the next 20 minutes to talk about um, a new thing, um, something that is actually challenging this picture. So something that, um, so this is the, maybe just for a little bit more context. So this kind of like a U-curve test error and best variance trade-off, this has been um, 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 like a dis discovered or kind of like analyzed for, I don't know how many years, maybe like 40 years or something like that. I mean, maybe, like, I, I'm not a historian, so I don't know exactly which is the, the first time this is uh, discovered, but this is like a very classic. Like, a, like um, uh, uh, however, people realize that there are some uh, issues with this understanding. Uh, especially, uh, we realize that in deep learning, like uh, you, like actually people start to realize this in deep learning, but actually it turns out that even this understanding has an issue for linear models. Um, so, so this understanding has a, is not complete. Uh, it has, uh, it, it's miss, uh, it misses some, uh, some other things. So, um, so that's what I'm gonna talk about. Um, and, and, and this is, a, this is an area of um, uh, uh, research um, pretty active in the last uh, probably three or four years. So let me try to find out where should I erase. Um, So this phenomenon that people observe empirically at the beginning and then analyze theoretically, uh, this phenomenon is called double descent. If you, if you are a historian, then I think actually this, the, 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 this phenomenon actually dates back to something like 1990. Um, um, some papers actually at that time also point out this issue, but I think it just becomes popularized uh, and, and more relevant these days. And, uh, and what does this mean is that, so basically I've told you that this is test error. This is model complexity. I guess technically I'm, here I'm writing the number of parameters because I want to be precise. Like I'm measuring the model complexity by how many parameters you have. And the classical belief as we discussed is that this test error should have this U curve, something like this. But then people realize that this is a striking thing. So people realize that if you increase your model number of parameters even more, at some point you will see that it will be like this. So this is the, basically this is the new regime that people got. This is the second descent of the test error. That's why it's called double descent because there's a descent here, there's a descent here. And, and this is the, um, all, everything the blue part is pe what people didn't realize um, as, as much as, as in the last four years, last four or five years. Um, and, and, and these are the so-called over-parametrized regime. So which means that in this regime, typically the number of parameters is larger than the number of data points. In some sense, this is the regime that if you ask uh, you know, uh, someone 20 years ago, then they would say this regime is just a, a dead no-go zone because you should see very, very bad test error. But it turns out that if you have more, par you make it even more extreme, you make the number of parameters bigger than the number of data points, uh, you, you may actually, um, in, in, not in all cases, but in some cases, you may see uh, the, um, in, in actually, not, I wouldn't say, I shouldn't say more, some cases, like in many cases, like, like a, 
I'm not sure how to quantify this, but at least uh, you know, in a, um, uh, a lot of cases, um, you will see a second descent. So, um, so that's the striking thing. So is this um, not directly, let's say, because this is you know, at least on the surface. If you look at this, right? So you 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 observe this regime is the regime where the parameters is bigger than the number of data points. So 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 if you want to find a direct cause, you know, I'm not saying um, like you probably would say at least you need. To, to, to be in this regime, probably you need to compute. You need a lot of compute. Because uh, probably, you know, like 10 years ago or 20 years ago, you cannot even afford to run experiments in this regime because you don't, you don't want to use that many parameters because you don't have enough compute. Right? So, but of course, you know, in, 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 in nowadays, we also have more data points. So, uh, and because we have more data points, because we are using networks, works, you know, we, we run larger and larger experiments. You know, so, so Indeed, we, it's correlates with more data points. Like we do see more data points in uh, these days, right? So, um, and this is the the, the so-called double descent phenomenon, and it's kind of mysterious. Um, uh, it's a bit less mysterious these days, like uh, after people have studied um, this, you know, in the last five years um, very carefully. Um, I will talk about some of the explanations, intuitions, um, but before that, let me also give another. Um, a related phenomenon, which is um, also called double descent, but it's called model wise, um, it's called data wise double descent. So here I'm doing a, um, a similar, I'm just drawing a similar graph, but on the x axis, I'm going to change the number of data points. So, So here, the, the y-axis is still a test error. And the x-axis is the number of data points. So, and now, okay, maybe you have a guess first. You know, what, what this curve should look like? When, as you have more and more data points, how does the test error change? Right, the guess would be the test error would be decreasing, right? Because I guess, here, you know, at least if you believe in this bias and virus kind of intuition, then the bias doesn't seem to depend much on the data, right? The virus will be smaller and smaller as you have more and more data, right? So, so then what, what you, if you believe in that, then you should say that, okay, the test error should look like this and it should continue to decrease uh, as you have more and more data. And it turns out that actually, um, in many cases, what happens is that the test error will look like this. It will increase at some point and it will decrease again. And, and this peak here is kind of like similar to the peak here. So this peak is often happening when um, when n is roughly equal to d. I guess. By the way, here, like, you know, there's a, this is an active research area, so I'm not being very precise in every place. So, um, uh, so n is the number of examples. This is the number of examples. This is the number of parameters. So what I said here, um, I think is basically mostly kind of 100% correct for linear models, but for nonlinear models, you know, whether this is exactly n is equal to d or not, is n 2d or the relationship is a bit less uh, clear. But let's say, suppose we think about relatively simple models, then um, when n, the number of data points is closer to the number of parameters, then in this case, you, you're gonna see a peak. And then after that, you have more data, it actually helps. I saw some questions. So with the original double descent, does that like continue to decrease or does it eventually increase again? Um, so in the in the first figure. So in the first figure, this this is a good question. So I think I've seen empirically um, um, both cases. So sometimes it does increase again a little bit, but often not much. And sometimes it just keeps decreasing, and sometimes it plateaus. So so I think that's why people probably don't study that part <laughs> that much. Yeah. Oh, just to so this is again a modern discovery. 
This one, I think, is, is also new. Like, uh, I think this, actually, the paper that first systematically discussed this is like 2020. Um, when was that discovered? The peak? Yeah. And you, this discovery in the same paper, right? The peak, there, there is, it's not monotone. The fact that there exists a peak was also discovered by research. Yeah, I oh. think at least, uh, you know, they might, you know, like uh, in machine learning, it happens so often that, you know, someone did something and then people, the, the community forgot about it. Um, that, that's possible, but at least I would say, like, at least uh, it's only until 2020 that people start to, most people start to, Realize this, and because of the, the that paper that shows this. What's the name of the paper? Uh, I think the paper is just called Model Wise Double Design or something like that. Um, maybe I'm oh, sorry, Data 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 Wise Double Design. Data. So because this is Data Wise, because you are changing the number of data points. Right. So um, okay. So now okay. This sounds like mysterious enough, right? So like a very very interesting. Um, and what's the what's the explanations, right? In the last few years, um, people try to ex try explain why this what happens, right? And uh, try to reconcile with our old um, understanding about this. Um, and also, this is an important question because this regime, this blue regime, is actually um, actually you can you can it's it's uh, it's not clear whether when you run like a classical linear models, I don't think necessarily you're in this regime, but at least it's pretty cl clear that. Um, it's, it's at least more, it's, it's more um, true that uh, for, for deep learning, you are basically always in this region. At least for, I guess this is still, you know, it's, not, it's never, nothing is never universally true, but I think for most of the vision experiments, you are in this regime where you have more uh, parameters than a data point. So, th so this is something that is really like a empirically relevant, so that's why people really care about it. So, um, and maybe another thing I, I, I need to clarify is that I kept, I think I, I was, I think I probably mentioned that, you know, this, the study about the linear models, the phenomenon on linear models is, um, uh, is, uh, uh, is more kind of clear, like there are a lot of studies and we have pretty good conclusion. And what I mean by that is that even within linear models, you can try to change the model complexity. So what I, what I, what I mean is that you just insist that you always use linear model. But what you change is that you, 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 you try to decide how many features you use. So you can start with only using one feature or two features, like the, for example in the house price where you can use the, the square foot as the single feature or you can collect a bunch of other features. Right, so you keep adding more and more features. That means you have more and more parameters. Right, so, so even within linear models, you can still change the complexity, just to clarify that. So, and, and, and most of this uh, theoretical study, I think, are for linear models, and they are pretty precise these days. Um, and I'm, I'm going to try to kind of roughly summarize the intuition from the st study of this double descent. So the intuition, I think, um, I'm going to list a few of them. So, So some intuition and explanations. And these explanations are mostly for linear models. Um, so I think the first thing to realize is that this peak, so you, you can, can argue what is the most exciting or, or surprising thing about this graph, right? So but let's, let's first talk about the peak, right? This uh, peak in the middle. So I think the, the first thing is that, in some sense, people realize that the existing algorithms, um, especially if you just talk about, for example, simple gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent for linear models, so the existing algorithms so underperform dramatically on when n is close to d. So, so it, both these two peaks are basically like this, right? So here you are changing n, the number of data points, and you found that when n is close to d, you hit the peak. And here you are changing the number of parameters, you are changing d, the number of features you use, and we've realized when d is kind of about n, about the number of data points, you, you hit the peak. So both of these two peaks, two peaks are, are, are showing up here. It's just that you are changing the axis in some sense. So this is also when 
n is close to d. When the number of uh, number of uh, data points is close to the number of uh, features. So, so and uh, and the, the the explanation is that just the algorithms, the existing algorithms, or the algorithms you are visualizing here, right? So you, when you visualize this, right, you do you do run expire some you do use some algorithms to learn the parameters. Right? So that particular algorithm that you use to produce this graph, it's, it it really underperforms very uh, dramatically. It's, it doesn't. It's not really saying that when n is close to d, the, the real test error should be this. It's just saying that this algorithm is bad. If you change the algorithm, you probably wouldn't see this peak. So, so that's why the peak shows up. So, um, and okay, so, so and what's, what's wrong with the, 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 by existing algorithm, I really just mean that, for example, some just basic gradient descent thing. So, um, so for linear models, maybe this is, let's say this is for linear models. So, so, for, so what goes wrong with the so-called existing algorithm, right? So this um, basically gradient descent algorithms. So um, the, the, the what goes wrong is that the norm uh, of the the the, uh, the the theta, the 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 linear models you learned, uh, uh, is very big. It's very big uh, when n is roughly equal to d. So and and, and the, uh, we kind of believe that this is at least a partial reason uh, for why this leads to a peak. So this gives the peak. So even though um, so okay so I guess let me draw something here. Uh, we we have some real experiment, real data in the lecture notes, but if you draw that norm, so suppose you 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 change the number of parameters. Which means you add more and more features in your in your in your data set, uh, and so that you have more and more parameters. And you, if you visualize the norm in the y-axis, you're going to see something like this. And this peak here is roughly corresponds to n is close to d, and which is kind of similar to these peaks. So so basically, even though suppose you, you compare this 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 experiment and this experiment, right? So so here you have more parameters than this than here, but when you have more parameters, maybe sometimes you have lower, smaller norm. So the norm when n is close to d, for some reason, it is very very big. And there, there are actually we know the reasons. The reason is that some random matrix you know is not well um, behaved when n is close to d. Um, but I guess we are not going to go into that. But at least the, the immediate reason is that when n is close to d, somehow this algorithm. Is producing a very large norm uh, 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 classifier theta, which uh, is you know you can argue that the norm is if the norm is too big, then the model is too complex. So, so so in some sense, this is saying that your model is actually very complex. So very complex uh, according to the norm. So this model seemingly doesn't have a lot of parameters compared to, for example, this model. So if you compare this model and this model, so this model seems to have less parameters than this, right? That's by definition. But the norm is actually very big. So in some sense, if you use the norm as the complexity, actually, uh, these peaks have large complexity. Yeah, out to norm. Exactly. Out to Right, that's a great, great question. So, 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 uh, so, so you got that. You know, I'm implying that the you know, norm seems to be a better metric for the complexity. Right. So, what is the right uh, measure for complexity? So, this is a very difficult question. Like uh, for different situations, you have different answers. Um, um, so, so, but you know, there is no u universal answer. But norm could be one uh, complex measure. In some sense, the norm is also a way to describe how many. Like suppose you have a small norm ball, right? So you have fewer choices to, to, to fit your data in some sense. So you have a fewer degree of freedom if you have, um, you know, in, like a, you have um, fewer options in some sense to fit your data. So that's restrict the complexity. And which norm, uh, that's, that's actually um, for different situations, you can argue which norm is the right complexity. Actually, there's probably no universal answer. But, but I, what I, I guess what I'm trying to say here is that the number of parameters is also not necessarily 
the right complex measure. Because even if you have more parameters, suppose all the parameters are very, very close to zero, that's probably also a very simple model because those parameters are not really working. Right? So, so, but if you have just a few parameters, but the norm is really, really big, maybe you can use the, the right, maybe you should also call, call it very complex. So you know, my short answer is that there's no universal uh, answer to this. Um, um, the, the, uh, the point is that uh, you know, probably the number of parameters is not the only complex measure. So, and for linear model, it just happens that for mathematical reasons, I think L2 norm behaves really nice. Like, it, it seems to relate to a lot of like, fundamental properties. Like, maybe you can argue L2 norm is useful because you are measuring a square error in many cases, and, and it's, it's, it's nice with the linear algebra, so on and so forth. Uh, OK, so I guess let me, I'm running a little bit late, but I think I'm almost done here. So, um, Right, so, so here it's just saying that at least for this case, it sounds like norm seems to be a slightly better complex measure. And, and actually, if you, um, you, and you can test this hypothesis in some sense. So you can say that, okay, I'm, I'm saying here the existing algorithm underperforms. But if you have a new algorithm that uh, regularizes, suppose you regularize the, um, the norm. I guess I haven't told you exactly what regularization means, but here, just what I mean is that you, you try to find a model such that the norm is small. So, so you add an additional term that tries to make the norm small. So you don't only train on the training loss, but also you try to make the norm smaller. Uh, then you're going to see something like this. So, so regularization would mitigate this to some extent. I, I will discuss more about the regularization uh, in the next lecture. But here, just it really just means that you you don't you don't only care about the training loss, but also you try to find uh, uh, a, a, a model with small norm. So you and you have some kind of like balance between them, right? So you can sacrifice a little bit of the training error, but you insist that your norm is small, then you can see this kind of thing. Right, so, so that in some sense explains partially why you had a peak, because the peak is caused because your algorithm was suboptimal, right? Your algorithm didn't use the right complex measure, um, and you can fix that peak by adding norm. But there's one more question, which is, you know, there's no peak, but why there's no Ascent, right? So, so suppose you just see this, right? Well, actually, here you, also, you will also see this, something like this. So this figure is actually pretty meaning, reasonable because if your data point is increasing, you probably should just have one decrease, like you just keep decreasing your, um, uh, you, you, you just keep decreasing the, the test error, right? So this one, let's say we, we are okay with it. We are happy if you see just a single, um, single decrease. But here, suppose you see a single descent, right? I, I feel like it's still, you know, it's, it's kind of arguable whether you, you, are, you should be happy with this answer because, because um, why when the number of parameters is so huge, you can still generalize, right? So why when you use, for example, a million parameters and you just have like five examples, why you can still generalize? Why you, you don't have a, a ascent eventually? And in many cases, you don't have ascent. And in and, and many cases, the best one is just you have more and more parameters. So, um, and, and, and actually, for example, another question is that when number of parameters is bigger than the number of data points, you know, sometimes you are thinking this is the, you have too many degree of freedom to fit all the um, specifics of the data set, you shouldn't generalize. But actually, empirically, you do work pretty well. So that's the, that's the last, uh, in some sense, the, the, another missing point, um, missing part. And this part, um, we also have some explanation for that. And the explanation is that so when n is very much, much bigger than d, right, sorry, d is much bigger than n, the, the, the number of parameters is much bigger than the, the, the d, the, the, uh, sorry, the much bigger than the n, the, the number of data points. So the thing is that even though it sounds like you, you are supposed to overfit, but actually the, the, the norm is small. But why the norm is small? Right? Why, when you have so many parameters, you still learn a very s simple model? The reason is that somehow there is, a, um, there is, a, there is a, uh, uh, some Im implicit regularization effect. Which makes the norm small. So, so, so when, you, when I plot this, right, so all of these experiments didn't have any regularization. I didn't have any 
explicit encouragement to make the norm small. So that's why the norm here is very big. But why the norm here is, is small? The reason is that the, the, your, your optimization algorithm has some implicit encouragement to make the norm small, which, which is not used, which is not explicitly written in the, in the loss function. So, um, and that's something I'm going to discuss, uh, uh, I think, more next time. Um, um, right, so, 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 so for this lecture, I think I, I'm just, uh, so, so we're going to discuss this more uh, next time. So the, um, yeah, the high level thing is just that something else is, is driving the norm to be small. Thanks. <laughs>